The family of the late Tyke McClurg consisted of three loons and a lassie. Tyke had never done anything for his children, except share with a short-lived and shadowy mother the responsibility of bringing them into the world. The time that he could spare from his profession of poacher, he had systematically devoted to neglecting them. Tyke had solved successfully for many years the problem of how to live by the least possible expenditure of labour. Kind ladies had taken him in hand time and again. They had provided clothes for his children, which Tyke had primarily converted into coin of the realm and indirectly into liquid refreshment at Lucky Morgan's rag store in Cairn Edward. Work had been found for Tyke, and he had done many half days of labour in various gardens. Unfortunately, however, before the hour of noon, it was Tyke's hard case to be taken with a groom in his inside of such a nature that he became rapidly incapacitated for further work. No, ma'am, I can't attack it. It's mony a year since I saw the evil out. You'll hate to excuse me, but I really couldn't. Oh, they pains. Oh, Cersei, my inside. Well, can you insist? I'll just hate to try a toothful to oblige you like. But Tyke's toothfuls were over for this world, and his shortcomings were lying under four feet of red mould. Half a dozen kindly folk, who pitied his three loons and a lassie, gathered a few pounds and gave him a decent burial, not for his own sake, but in order that the four little scarecrows might have a decent start in life. It is the most fatal and indestructible of reproaches in the south of Scotland to have a father buried by the parish. The lassie was the eldest of the children. She was thirteen, and she hardly remembered what, what it was to have a mother or a new frock. But ever since she was eleven she had never had a dirty one. The smith's wife had showed her how to wash, and she had learnt from the teacher how to mend. Lieb had appeared on the books of the school as Elizabeth McClurg, and she had attended as often as she could, that is, as often as her father could not prevent her, for Tyke, being an independent man, was down on the compulsory clause of the Education Act, and had more than once got thirty days for assaulting the school board officer. When he found out that Lieb was attending school at the village, he lay in wait for her on her return, with a stick, and after administering chastisement on general principles, he went on to specify his daughter's iniquities. Ye upsetting blasty, would ye be for gang into their school, learning to look doon on your ain feather that has been except pains to rear ye? A pause for further correction, to which poor Lee vocalised an accompaniment. Let me see gin ye can read. Mac, read that, he said, flinging a tattered lesson book which the teacher had given her to his daughter. Lieb opened the book, and punctuating the lesson with her sobs, she read in the high and level shriek of a locomotive engine, and so, brave Bobby, having saved the trembling child, returned with the rescued one in his mouth to the shore. Davert, but you can read, said her father, snatching the book and tearing it up before her eyes. Now listen, I'll hear nane of my bairns teach to despise their feather by no school boards. Look ye here, Lieb McClug, can I ever catch ye within a mile of the school, I'll skin ye. But for all this tremendous threat, or maybe all the more because of it, and also because she so much desired to be able to do a white seam, Lieb so arranged it that there were few days when she did not manage to come along the mile and a half of Lochside Road, which separated her from the little one-roomed whitewashed schoolhouse on the face of the Bray. She even brought one of the loons with her pretty often. But as Jock, Rab and Benny, otherwise known as Ragtag and Bobtail, got a little older, they more easily accommodated themselves to the wishes of their parent and in spite of Lieb's blandishments, they went into hidey holes till the school board officer had passed by. McClurg's mill, where the children lived, was a tumble-down erection, beautiful for situation, set on the side of the long lock of Kennick. The house had once been a little farmhouse, its windows brilliant with geraniums and verbenas, but in the latter days of the forlorn McClurg's, it had become betrampled as to its doorsteps by lean swine and bespattered as to its broken floor by intrusive hens. It was to McClurg's mill that the children returned after the funeral. Lieb had been arrayed in the hat and dress of a neighbour's daughter for the occasion, but the three loons had played Tig in the intervals of watching their father's funeral from the broomy knoll behind the mill. Jock, the eldest, was nearly eleven and had been taken in hand by the kind neighbour wife at the same time as Lieb. At one time he looked as though he would even better repay attention, for he feigned a sleek-faced submission and a ready compliance, which put Mistress Old of the Arkland off her guard. Then, as soon as his sister, of whom Jock stood most in awe, was gone out, he snatched up his ragged clothes and fled to the hill. 
Here, he was immediately joined by the other two loons. They caught the Arkland donkey grazing in the field beside the mill dam, and having made a parcel of the good black trousers and jacket, they tied them to the donkey and drove him homewards with blows and shoutings. A funeral was only a dull procession to them, and the fact it was their father's made no difference. Next morning, Liebs sat down on the stoop, or wooden bench by the door, and proceeded to cast up her position. Her assets were not difficult to reckon. A house of two rooms, one devoted to hens and lumber, a mill which had once sawn good timber, but whose great circular saw had stood still for many months, a mill laid, broken down in several places, three or four chairs and a stool, a table and a wash tub. When she got so far she paused. It was evident there could be no more school for her, and the thought struck her that now she must take responsibility for the boys and bring them up to be useful and diligent. She did not and could not so express her resolve to herself, but a still and strong determination was in her sore little heart not to let the boys grow up like their father. Lieb had gone to Sabbath school every week, when she could escape from the tyranny of home, and was therefore well known to the minister, who had often exercised himself in vain on the thick defensive armour of ignorance and stupidity which encompassed the elder McClurg. His office bearers and he had often bemoaned the sad example of this ne'er-do-well family which had entrenched itself in the midst of so many well-doing people. McClurg's mill was a reproach and an eyesore to the whole parish, and the McClurg wains a gratuitous insult to every self-respecting mother within miles. For three miles round the children were forbidden to play with, or even to speak to, the four outcasts at the mill. Consequently, their society was much sought after. When Lee came to set forth her resources, she could not think of any except the four-pound loaf, the dozen hens and a cock, the routing wild Indian of a pig, and the two lean and knobby cows on the hill at the back. It would have been possible to have sold all these things, perhaps, but Lieb looked upon herself as trustee for the rest of the family. She resolved, therefore, to make what use of them she could, and having most of the property under her eye at the time, there was less need to indict an inventory of it. But first, she must bring her brothers to a sense of their position. She was a very Napoleon of thirteen, and she knew that now there was no counter-authority to her own, she could bring Jock, Rob and Benny to their senses very quickly. She therefore suggested with some care and attention a hazel stick, using a broken table knife to cut it with a great deal of deftness. Having trimmed it, she went out to the hill to look, up, look for her brothers. It was not long before she came upon them, engaged in the fascinating amusement of rooting for pig nuts in a green bank side. The natural Lieb would instantly have thrown down her wand of office and joined them in the search, but the Lieb of today was a very different person. Her second thought was to rush among them and deal lusty blows with the stick, but she fortunately remembered that in that case they would scatter, and that by force she could only take home one, or at the most two. She therefore called to her assistance the natural guile of her sex. "'Boys, are you hungry?' she said. "'They're sick a grand big loaf come for the Arkland.' By this time all her audience were on their feet. "'Anne, I'll milk the kai, and we'll hear feast.' "'Come on, Jock,' said Rab, the second loon and the leader in mischief. "'I'll raise you for the loaf.' "'You needn't do that,' said Lieb calmly. "'The doors lock it.' So as Lieb went along, she talked to her brothers as sober as though they were models of good behaviour and all the virtues, telling them what she was going to do and how she would expect them to help her. By the time she got them into the mill yard, she had succeeded in stirring their enthusiasm, especially that of Jock, to whom with a natural tact she gave the wand of the office of sergeant, a rank which, on the authority of Sergeant Macmillan, the village pensioner, was understood to be very much higher than that of General. Sergeant Jock foresaw much future interest in the disciplining of his brothers, and entered with eagerness into the new ploy. The out-of-doors livestock was also committed to his care. He was to drive the cows along the roadside, and allow them to pasture on the sweetest and most succulent grasses, while Rab scouted in the direction of the village for superstitious policemen who were understood to take up and sell for the Queen's benefit all cows found eating grass on the public highway. Immediately after Jock and Rab had received a hunch of the Arkland loaf and their covenanted drink of milk, they went off to drive the cows to the Loch Road, so they might at once begin to fill up their lean sides. Benny, the youngest, who was eight past, she reserved for her own assistant. He was a somewhat tearful but willing little fellow, whose voice haunted the precincts of McClurg's mill like a wistful ghost. His brothers were constantly running away from him, 
and he pattering after them as fast as his little fat legs could carry him, roaring with open mouth at their cruelty, the tears making clean watercourses down his grimy cheeks. But Benny soon became a new boy under his sister's exclusive care. New Benny, she said, you and me's gone to clean the hoose. Jock and Rab will no be kenning it when they come back. So having filled the tub with water from the mill laid and carried every movable article of furniture outside, Lee began to wash out the house and rid it of the accumulated dirt of years. Benny carried small bucketfuls of water to swill over the floor. Gradually, the true colour of the stones began to shine up and the black encrustation to retreat towards the outlying corners. I'm going down to the village, she said abruptly. Benny, you keep scrubbing along the walls. Lieb took her way down rapidly to where Joe Turner, the village mason, was standing by a newly begun pigsty or swinery, stirring a heap of lime and sand. Get way out of that, he said instantly with the threatening gesture which every villager except the minister and the mistress of Arkland instinctively made on seeing a McClurg. This it is to have a bad name. But Lieb stood her ground, strong in the consciousness of her good intentions. Mr Turner, she said, could you let me hear a bucket for your twa whitewash for the mill kitchen? and I'll pay ye in hen's eggs. Her hens are laying fine, and your mistress is fond of an egg in the morning. Joe stopped and scratched his head. This was something new, even in a village where a good deal of business is done according to the rules of truck or barter. What are ye gone to do with the whitewash? He inquired, to get time to think. There was little whitewash in use about McClurg's mill in your father's time. But I'm going to bring up the boys as they should, said Lieb with some natural importance, sketching triangles on the ground with her bare toe. And what's whitewash got to do with that? asked Joe with some asperity. Lieb could not just put the matter into words, but she instinctively felt it had a good deal to do with it. Whitewash was her badge of respectability, both inside the house and out, in which Lieb was at one with modern science. I'll give three dozen of eggs for three bucketfuls, she said. And who do I ken that I'll ever see ain of the eggs? asked Joe. I've brought the dozen with me new, said Lieb, promptly producing them from under her apron. Lieb got the whitewash that very night, and the loan of a brush to put it on with. Next morning, the farmer of the Cray received a shock. There was something large and white down on the loch side, where ever since he came to the Cray he had seen nothing but the trees which hid McClurg's mill. I must do it, it's going to be terrible weather. I never saw that hoosome type McClurg's half hill afore he said. The minister came by that day and stood perfectly aghast at the new splendours of the McClurg mansion. Hitherto, when he had strangers staying with him, he took them another way in order that his parish might not be disgraced. Not only were the walls of the house shining with whitewash, but the windows were cleaned, a piece of white muslin curtain was pinned across each, and a jug with a bunch of heather and wildflowers looked out smiling on the passers-by. The minister bent his steps to the open door. He could see the two McClurg cows pasturing placidly with much contented head tossing on the roadside, while a small boy sat above, labouring at the first rounds of a stocking. From the house came the shrill voice of singing. Out of the firwood, over the knoll, came a still smaller boy, bent double with a load of sticks. In the window, written with large sprawling capitals on the leaf of a copybook, under the heading, Encourage Earnest Endeavour, appeared the striking legend. Sewing and mending done. Good cow's milk, sticks for firewood, cheap may laid eggs by Elizabeth McClurg. The minister stood regarding, amazement on every line of his face. Lieb came out singing, a neatly tied bundle of chips made out of the dry debris of the sawmill in her hand. Elizabeth, said he, what is the meaning of this? Will you be pleased to step Ben, said Lieb. The minister did so, and was astonished to find himself sitting down in a spotless kitchen, the walls positively painfully white, the wooden chairs scoured with sand till the very fibre of the wood was blanched, and on a floor, so clean that one might have dined off it, the mystic whirls and crosses of whiting which connect all good Galloway housekeepers with runic times. Before the minister went out to McClurg's mill, he had learned the intentions of Lieb to make men of her brothers. He said, You were a woman already before your time, Elizabeth which was the speech of all others best fitted to please Lead McClurg. He also ordered milk and eggs for the manse to, to be delivered by Benny, and promised that his wife should call upon the little head of the house. As he went down the road by the lockside, he meditated, and this was the substance of his thought. If that girl brings up her brothers like herself, tight McClurg's children may yet be examples to the flock. 
But as to this, we shall see.